Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Charlie. I'm an alcoholic. I'd like to thank Chris for inviting me to participate at this meeting. It's uh, always an honor to be asked to participate in Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, I don't take it lightly. And uh, uh, this is great. I mean, this is, I, I came in yesterday, and Chris showed me around town a little bit, and then today I kind of schlepped around and, and uh, just hung out. Um, I'm not a real hangout kind of guy, usually, unless it's in my house with the drapes drawn, uh, but um, I was really doing some major hanging out today. I uh, was just amazed that there's no place to get a good cup of coffee in this town, is there? <laughs> wow. Uh, you just really found a whole new opening for Columbia and your economy up here. It's amazing. Um, I... I um, I have a really tepid talk. Um, my story is not terribly exciting. I have a kind of a weak uh, sobriety, and then I don't have much I've learned either. So if you're here for a night of uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, it's going to be a long evening for you, I'm afraid. Um, I, um, we, were talking, we were talking at dinner about how hard it is to be in a work environment. I, now, trust me. I only started working in an office a few years ago. I, I'm used to manual labor. I mean, you can take one look at me and go, him? But um, I used to do that all my life. And um, sometimes they have meetings where they ask you to go around the table and say your name. And we were laughing about that tonight. Chris said, does it ever bother you when, you have, when someone at a meeting at work asks you to say your name? And I thought, yeah, because it, I can't focus on anything else, especially if they start at one person and it's going all the way around the room before it gets to me. I'm so self-conscious I can't hear anybody else's name because I don't want to break my anonymity. Uh, so I was at a, a Daddy and Me class. They have these little, I don't know if they have them up here, but in, in L.A. they've got things called Daddy and Me, which is where you bring your children on Saturdays. You sit around with a bunch of the other fathers and laugh and scratch and drink coffee and insult the facilitator. And um, so I went to this thing, and, and I'm not much of a joiner anyway, but I go there, and there's about 30 dads around this big table, and, and these guys are really funny and boisterous, and, the, and they can't get any control in the meeting, so the facilitator said, okay, we're going to go around the table, and everyone say your name and what you do. So it started, you know, it started and I, I was about the fifth person. I'm sitting there waiting, and it gets up to me, and I... I just, I, I finally, you know, just said, I'm, I'm Charlie. <laughs> and I work, and I told him what I did. And so we're going around the table. I was so relieved I didn't say it. And we're going around the table, going around the table, going around the table. And some poor guy across from me goes, I'm Tom, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a. <laughs> Four of us said, hi, Tom. <laughs> So, if you are really new in here and you think you can escape us, guess again. Um, we, we know where you are and we are everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, when I was newly sober, I, I skip around. I, I start out really slow and then I build to it. Just a, a, a shattering climax. But I... Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll skip around a little bit. I because um, I can't remember a can talk. That's unfortunate for me. I wish I could, but I um, when I got sober, I was I was going to meetings. I wasn't really involved in AA. You know what I mean? I'd go there and drink their coffee and and uh, and swat at flies and things. I didn't really get involved because I really thought this was a lame program until I almost drank in about 40 days and somebody sent me to the Pacific Group. So I go to the Pacific Group. I'm sitting in the back of the room. I got there at 8:29 because I wanted to get there early and get a good seat, you know. Uh, and start at 8:30. And I, I um, I'm in the back of the room and I'm sitting next to this twitchy lady, and she's 
you know, in her seat, and, and she looks at me, and she goes, I'm Alice. And I said, well, hi, hi, Alice, I'm Charlie. And she said, how long are you sober? And I said, well, I'm, I'm 50 days. I have 50 days at the time. I had about 50 days, which irritated the hell out of her because she had about 35. And she goes, oh. And then she says, you got a sponsor yet? And I said, no, I don't have a sponsor yet. And she says, well, you better get you one. And I thought, yeah, yeah, I'll uh, note it. I'll get me one real quick. Um, where, where might one find him one? Um, so she said, uh, she said, you in the Pacific group? And I said, well, not really. I just came here tonight. Someone sent me here. And she said, uh, were you going to go to the watch afterward? Because they had a watch. You know, they had all these activities. I didn't know what a watch was. It was all code talk to me. I didn't even know what traditions were. But, and so I said, no, I don't think so. And she said, will you be at the meeting tomorrow night? And I said, I, I'm really not sure. I don't know where the meeting is tomorrow night. And she said, well... You got a pen? And I said, yeah. I, you know, or she had a pen. She said, you got a piece of paper to write on. I said, okay. So I gave her a deposit slip from my checking account because fat chance anything was going to happen with that soon. And so I gave this to Alice. And Alice, Alice took this pen. I swear to God, this pen was, was a hypodermic needle with ink in it. And in the tiniest, most legible print I have ever seen, she wrote the directions. She'd been grilling me in the meantime about where I worked and what I did. And also, she gave me directions from my job uh, in Santa Monica to every single meeting of that group, Monday through Sunday, from the driveway of where I worked. You know, you go pull out your driveway on Tuesday night, and you make a left, and then you make a quick right. And, I, and, I, and she wrote it all out. And I swear, I carried that in my wallet for about six months till it fell apart. But uh, So I go to the meeting the next night, and... I'm standing in that meeting look, feeling, you know, completely comfortable. <laughs> I was like being sentenced to lose a rama, you know. Um, and everybody's happy. Yes, and, and the Pacific group, you know, that's my home group. And it's one of those, if, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. And uh, I, I, I've got a whiff of a little of that around here. Uh, I... Uh, I hope you can I hope you can weed that enthusiastic element out of your meeting pretty quick. But uh, anyway, just teasing. I don't want to get any, I don't want Chris to get in any trouble. Um, so I go to the Thursday night meeting. I'm standing there, and, and here, yeah, I'm, I turn around, and there's it's Alice standing there, and she's she's Hey, I'm Alice. Remember me? And I said Yeah, yeah, I do. And she says uh, You got a sponsor yet? And I said No, I don't, Alice. And she says You better get you one. And I said Yeah, yeah, I will. Every night, the following night was a men's stag, so I knew uh, for a moment I'd be safe. Uh, and then I went to the Saturday night meeting, and, and sure enough, you know, she would come out of nowhere. It was just, it was terrifying. It was, and, you know, all of a sudden it's just Alice appearing, you know, and, and the same thing. You got a sponsor, you didn't get you. Yeah, 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 I get it. Okay, uh, I didn't do that. I just, okay. And um, so the following Monday I'm driving to work, and I'm on the F San Diego freeway, Everybody's moving at a pretty good clip, and all of a sudden traffic slows down, and the car in front of me just stopped. And I'm doing 40, and I, I'm in an old, my old beat-up Volkswagen, you know, and I, and I slam the brakes on, and it squeeze, screeches up and just doesn't hit the car in front of me. And I thought, oh, my God. And I look in the rearview mirror, and there's a guy coming up behind me, and he's talking to the person next to him, you know. And he looks up, and whoa, and he slammed his brakes on just accordion my car between the two cars. So no one was hurt. I get out of the car. Neither of the guys speaks English. I'm going, I, I don't know what to do. You know, I'm just sort of freaking out. And it's and the traffic now is slowed to a crawl, I mean, just, which is happening in L.A. And, and uh, traffic's driving by. I'm standing there. I'm waiting for the police to come. These two guys are talking to each other but not talking to me. And I look up, and there's a car driving by, and it's Alice. You know? Um, I got a sponsor that night. Uh, she was like the, the angel of death, you know? Uh, just Alice everywhere. Alice, and, and she's still sober, as far as I know. And... Uh, yeah, but she said she helped me a lot by doing that. I mean, it doesn't matter how you carry the message, just as long as you carry it. And uh, and it doesn't matter why you take direction around here as long as you take it. You don't have to be sincere. We kind of 
appreciate your being insincere because you're more fun to watch anyway. But um, I, um, I didn't start out to be an alcoholic. I was, um, my parents, my dad was a, a, a carpenter. I was an only child. My mother was, as I like to say, a humble virgin woman. And uh, we lived in Anaheim, California, which was sort of the, the town that can't be underestimated. And uh, I had a pretty dull upbringing. I mean, we were just polite to each other. Um, I always felt different, oddball. I mean, I always felt, because I, I always had a sense that I didn't like the human race loathe the human race, actually. <laughs> but like any good alcoholic, having that contradictory thing going on where I demanded its approval at the same time, which really gives your life torque when you can't stand people, but you want them to adore you, you know? <laughs> it, it's confusing, but you can get it to work for you for a limited time. But I, um, I just always felt unsettled around people. And I, I liked humanity, but I did not care for individual human beings and where two or more are gathered, skip it. I don't need that. And uh, I, was, I was an isolated kid. I was sick a lot. I had asthma when I was a kid, and I was homesick a lot. And, you know, my dad had been a drill instructor in the Marine Corps. He was kind of, you know, worried about the issue of his loins. Because uh, all I did was sit around and, and read books and wheeze most of the time. And um, they would drag me around and try. You know, my parents didn't have a lot of resources, and they were trying to get me help and get medical help and stuff. And I... I was just unhappy, an unhappy kid all the time. My mother had had three babies that had died at birth, and I was the only one who survived out of four kids. And I never understood how that affected her, how that affects a woman. I just All I knew was that I wasn't getting enough of whatever it is that I needed inside, whatever that was. And I didn't like the kids at school, and I, and I did really well at school too, which was odd. I just had a natural uh, vocation for, for... I was a great speller, which was to certainly helped me later with women, and uh, I uh, had a, uh, I, I just managed to get by without having to exert too much effort and being able to be home ill a lot, and um, I just felt uncomfortable all the time, and then I get dragged into teachers' offices and, and uh, counselors' offices and priests' offices and every authority figure's office and have them say, Charles has potential, which is, oh, great, you know. Now I've got because I, I thought being told I had potential was sort of a compliment. I didn't realize till years later that they don't tell people who are successful that they have potential. <laughs> potential indicates a shortfall. Um, and I didn't. I thought when they said I had potential, I thought, yeah, <laughs> you're damn right. But I kept getting. <laughs> called into these offices and have them sit down and go, we, we don't know why Charles doesn't do anything with it. And my response is always the same. You know, I know I've got potential. You know I've got potential. The paperwork says I've got potential. My parents now know I've got... It seems like all God's children know i got potential. So I just wanted to make it clear that I will use my potential when I'm goddamn good and ready to use it. And not just because you suggested I do it, because I'm not, I'm not your pet poodle and I'm not going to go through the hoop for you just because you want me to. I'll use it. I hope when I do use it that you've got sunglasses on, Scooter, because I'm going to light you up. <laughs> but until then, I would suggest you take your concern for my potential and go wipe it on some other sap. Because if you were such hot shit anyway, you wouldn't be a high school counselor, now would you? Um, it, I, I, must, I, I must say, it didn't come out in exactly those words. Uh, I said something like, I'll try harder. But, uh, but I've always... Uh, I'm, I'm a rebel at heart. Um, I just didn't tell anybody. I, uh, I'm rebellious. So, well... You know, some of you did. You're the ones who did time. Um, uh, it's the same disease we got. It's just that, you know, you just did a little differently than I did. No, no, no hard feelings, really. Uh, um, I can't get on a jury either. But, uh... So... I went through school with absolutely no notoriety except, the, you know, as Don G says, crucified on the cross of potential. 
And uh, I wound up getting out of school at 17, went right into the music industry as a clerk at a record store, and I was working there. And <laughs> these, um, these guys came in that I knew from high school that were trouble. They had trouble written all over them, and, and I knew them in school as being troublemakers, and, and they were nice to me. And they, they asked me if I wanted to go to a party, you know. So I thought, well, sure. Uh, I'd never been to a party before. As, as I understood it, there were other people that generally go to parties. So I... I went to this party. I'd never gone to a party before, and it was exactly what I thought it would be. It was a whole bunch of stupid people doing stupid stuff who all knew each other, and they were all drinking, and they were all having a good time, and there was a lot of pot going around, and a lot of other stuff, and a lot of pieces of tin foil going around. I thought, who's eating all these Hershey Kisses? You know, and, and this is moving around the room. And I, I grew up in the 60s, and I, I never took a drug in the 60s because they were illegal, and my parents would disapprove. That's why I didn't take drugs. I was terrified of them. You know, I'd heard all the stories. If you grew up in the 60s, you heard the public service announcements with, you know, people like Frank Zappa and stuff saying, if you, if you take LSD and you're a little bit off center, you'll never come back. <laughs> I heard that. I knew I was a couple of clicks off the mark. I wasn't, I'm not going to risk not coming back. So I just, I wouldn't even know what I was coming back to, but I never thought that far. I just didn't want to have to come back and and so I never drank I never took drugs and I just thought they were stupid and I thought people who took it were stupid weak willed pathetic little bastards and I'm in the I'm at this party and everybody's confirming that you know I go to go to the bathroom and there's a couple in the bathtub and they're you know getting familiar and I I, I couldn't and it was just it's like it brings out the bad the worst behavior in everybody and I'm judging 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 sitting there getting more and more brittle and more and more irritated and then something happened to me, because I was always, in my, all my life, I've been restless and irritable and discontented. I've been upset and disappointed in the way people are. I've, I've, been, I've always railed at the way society doesn't live up to the way it ought to be, that people should act a certain way, and they don't. And I hate it. I hate it. I hate people. I like to read books, because at least in books they behave the right way when you get to the end, you know? There are people that do heroic things in books and, and die for their friends and, and are fair. And fairness prevails in books that I was reading when I was a kid. And then I get out in the world, and, and it's not that way at all. And, and I was angry about that. And I didn't know that, but, and I never told anybody either. And the anger, if you're like I am and you swallow down your anger, it leaks out in every other area of your life. And I'm standing there in that, in that party, and I was getting madder and madder. And... And finally, someone walked by and said, here, have a, have a drink. And they gave me a can of malt liquor. And what I was describing to you before, I don't think is exclusive to us. Because I hear people in AA going, you know, well, I never drank that much, but I relate to the feelings. Well, of course you relate to the feelings. They're human feelings. Every human has feelings of disappointment and anger and irritation and restlessness and grinding irritability and frustration and fear and depression. We've all got that, whether we're alcoholic or not. But that halfway through that can of malt liquor, I found my answer to all that stuff. I just started feeling like I'd been way too harsh on you. <laughs> halfway, halfway through that can of malt liquor, I started thinking, boy... I've really misjudged these people, you know. I started to feel comfortable in my own skin. I started to feel like I didn't care about all the other stuff that seemed phony 20 minutes before. I found myself taking deep breaths, as Clint H. talks about. I found myself feeling really forgiving. I found the Irish coming out of me, you know. I was a, a just a great mixture of, uh, you know, Errol Flynn and... David Niven and little John Lennon mixed in, you know, which is, is really hard to pull off when you, when you look like Sherman from the Mr. Peabody cartoons. But, um, but I was, you know, I was pulling it off. And I, I got through that can of malt liquor, and I felt, for the first time in my life, I felt alive. I felt like all of a sudden... That brittleness that was all around me had just broken down, and I felt like I, I, like I thought human beings were supposed to feel this way. We're supposed to feel this way, like, like you're just on the edge of tears out of gratitude for these people around you and the life and, and the flavor of things. You're, you're just grooving on everything. And I had, I had more that night because uh, what happened was I got there. Every alcoholic 
knows where there is. Those of you who took chips tonight for 30 days know where there is better than I do right now. But you might think that we forget after a period of years where there is. Uh Uh-uh. We all know where there is. We never forget. Because when I drank, that's, that's the only place I wanted to get was right there where everything was about to be okay. Everything was about to be better. And I could, I could believe in something and believe in the moment and believe that things were actually happening inside of me, you know, and things were working. I wasn't worried about yesterday or fearful of what's going to happen tomorrow. I was in the moment, you know. And, I, and it takes several cans of malt liquor to stay there. I mean, you can't just get there on one can or else we wouldn't be here, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> Um, sometimes I, you know, later on I just miss the there off ramp completely. You just kind of, what the hell was that? That was it. You know, and then, and then, uh, then you wind up there. And you know where that is. And and I, um, and I couldn't wait to drink again. Later that night, I was, I went into a blackout and I ran alongside of my best friend's car, the guy I went to the party with, hanging onto the door handle of that car and vomiting all over myself and just laughing my ass off because I had been to the mountaintop. I mean, I'd been, I, I had hope at that moment. And the real cheat of alcoholism, as far as I can see it, is that I've never forgotten that moment. In my whole life, and ever since then, it changed me completely. I've never forgotten that. And I've never forgotten, and I've never been free of the notion that about that much bourbon will take away all my pain. For however short a time it does, it will. It always is there to remind me that it will take away that pain for a short period of time. And that's what kills people like you and me. Because sometimes that feeling is so overwhelming that I can't turn away from it and can't, can't face that anymore. I just need to find some relief. And alcohol gave me complete and utter and unqualified relief from the way I am sober. That brittle, angry, resentful, fearful, good speller uh, <laughs> inadequate human being that I was. I got out when I was when I first started drinking. I was six uh, two and 127 pounds of uh, percolating testosterone. Uh, I was just on, you know. I was great. I was. I found what I wanted. Now my drunkalog is really dull, so I'm going to cut to the chase here. I mean, I, I've heard your drunkalogs; they're wonderful. I mean, arrests. I love arrests. I love girls with tattoos. I like danger. I like that. I worked at a motorcycle company for about three years during the easy rider craze, and I hung out with bikers. I mean, it's hard to believe. But I, I did. I was a, a dork amongst bikers, but I hung out with these guys. Um, and I'll tell you something. Where I drank, anybody messed with me got their head beat uh, outside by these guys because I had friends, you know, and I, I was just a goofy sidekick, but I loved to drink with these guys, and I loved, you know, I worked in this place where we had, uh, it was a factory, but they did they did uh, coating on those big Springer front ends on hog, on choppers, and, uh, and the big giant seats and stuff back in the late 60s, and, and uh, they had a bunch of welders that would work in there who were all alcoholics. You could hear them in the morning, everybody's, got, everybody's looking for a phlegm cutter in the morning, you know, everybody's <laughs> back in their welding area, <sighs> You know, and then um, uh, there was this guy. There was this guy. There was a guy who looked like something out of the old west who came in there. His name was Gary. He looked like one of the. The only way I can describe him, you know, those pictures that they used to take of guys that got shot in the old west and they put him in the casket and lean him against the wall. That's what Gary looked like. And all he, you'd hear him come in about an hour late. He'd be back there, and, and uh, you'd hear his welding torch go on, and you hear this. Tss- but you wouldn't hear anything else, just And then he'd get out his clicker after he'd left the thing on for maybe 20 seconds. Click, 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 kablam to this warehouse, and I hear him go, God damn! You know? I love these guys. And, and and they would and and they would come by in the afternoon. I was just a receiving clerk, you know. I I, I drove a Volkswagen, you know. But, 
But they would come by with a welcome wagon in the afternoon. It was a shopping cart that the parts puller had, and he would put a whole bunch of newspapers in it, and he'd have like eight bottles of booze in it, and you'd come by to everybody's station, you'd get a couple of shots of whatever you wanted and move on. I loved that job. I loved being there. I loved being part of it, you know, and alive. And just, just, I knew my kick-ass days were ahead of me, but I was ready, you know, at the time, and these guys were great. And, uh, but... You know, I wish I had their drunk log because they did things. Um, alcohol gave me the satisfaction of a job well done without having, having to do a damn thing at all, you know. <laughs> I would, uh, that's what alcohol did for me. I'd drink and go, why bother? I feel great, you know. Um, I always wanted to be a writer. I'd get home, I'd be ready to write. I'd get a piece of paper rolled up in the typewriter and go get a couple of drinks and go... Later, right now, I'm I'm thinking of my story now, and um, but I've heard your stories. I've heard about your arrests and your, you know, the savageries that the constabulary put on you. And and uh, I was never like that. I've never come out of a blackout yelling, "Cover me! I'm going in!" You know, uh, <laughs> I, hear, I hear people in my people in my area talking about. Yeah, I came out of a blackout, and somebody was saying, "Okay, cut the red wire." I go, "Wow, that's great! I wish." Uh, steady on, man. The summit's just ahead. I've never said that either. I, um, I, um, I would, I, I never came out of a blackout saying anything. Quite honestly, I, uh, I came out of blackouts with people saying stuff to me, like, you know, I, I bet that hurt. Um, I am, um, I'm, uh, I'm the kind of alcoholic who believes that the fastest way down a long flight of stairs is to just relax. <laughs> uh, take it like a man. Uh, I had, uh, I just drank. And I'll tell you something, there, I, I tell this story all the time. My, now that I think of it, I guess my pitch is pretty canned, but I... Uh, George Orwell wrote a story one time, and in it was a sentence that just stuck in my head that said that a tyrant wears a mask and his face grows to fit it. Certainly I'm glad it's not that way these days, but uh, I, I remember feeling, understanding that exactly, because when I was not drinking, I wanted you to see me as a certain kind of person, and I would hold a mask out there for you to look at. I would never be myself. I would always be some marionette of what I wanted you to think I was. And I would hold this mask out for you, and you'd pay attention to it. When I started drinking, it filled the gap between here and the back of that mask, and I fit the mask. And I believed I was exactly what I was putting out there for you. I was that person. I was going to do those things. I am going to be successful. I am going to be a writer. I am going to do something great in my life, with my life. I will. And then over a period of a dozen years or so, it stopped filling that gap little by little, imperceptibly, little by little, until pretty soon, on the 11th of June of 1981, I was holding that mask out there for everything I had, and I was completely drunk. And I couldn't get, there was no filling between me and that mask. It was just, a, I was dead inside. I was dead in a lot of different areas, and I was sick. And I'd gotten, you know, I tried my ways to extend my drinking and the satisfaction of it. I tried, uh, you know, I, we all have our little drug excursion. I took drugs. But the problem I had with drugs, and I think it's a big distinction between drugs and alcohol, is that drugs get me loaded. I know that big revelation for some of you, but I, um, <laughs> drugs make me loaded. I don't want to be loaded. I want to be there, you know? I want to be good, sharp as a knife there. I don't want to be sitting around smoking a bag of pot. I mean, how many times in a row can you listen to Layla? Uh, picking out that little guitar slide there, and, you know, and then at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm in the kitchen eating ketchup packets. I mean, that's... Uh, <laughs> I ate a bullion cube once <laughs> on, on marijuana. Wait a minute, because there's this logic behind that. It was, it was crunchy and it tastes like chicken. That was my reasoning about that. 
But I, I wasn't much. I just smoked my share of pot, but I'm not an addict because I never bought. But I, um, <laughs> and nobody, <laughs> nobody would ever, ever, under any circumstances, let me roll a joint because I always, they always looked like exploding cigars when I was done with them, you know. Uh, but, and I, I took, when I worked at that motorcycle shop, I took speed for about a year. Uh, it wasn't crazy about that. Uh, they used to have these little mini whites that they would, you could take that would make you work faster. Uh, I never liked the sensation, personally, of my eyes trying to beat me into the next room, you know. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, so I stopped taking that. I just stopped taking them, you know. Uh, I, want, I was one of those drinkers who... I would have uh, I would have parties or something. I'm not a party, but I had a Tupperware party, all right. And um, I was drunk at a friend's house. His wife was having a Tupperware party. I insulted the Tupperware hostess, and she challenged me. And I took the challenge, and I lost. And I had to give a Tupperware party, and I'm humiliated. And uh, and I was living above these two prostitutes in Santa Monica, and. Uh, so I, I, it was horrifying, and I had people I worked with, these women I worked with were coming over, and I got good and drunk that afternoon. I mean, I drank for about nine hours before this party was going to start, and I told the two women downstairs, I said, you know, I'm having some people over, we're having a, a, a James Joyce seminar, uh, so if we make too much noise, just let me know, and we'll tone it down. Like, we're going to make, like, we're going to get really rowdy over, you know, Ulysses, but I, um, so... She came to the house. I, we had this. There was apparently a Tupperware party took place, based on what I heard later. Uh, I apparently took her products and drop kicked them out the door. And I was living on the second floor of a hill apartment, so I'm just they just bounced down the street. Uh, I was throwing them to show how strong they were. I trashed my own apartment, and then wound up. I woke up the next morning with one of the guests. Um, which is true form, true to form. I didn't remember a thing, but I, um, you know, I was humiliated by that. It was, it was god awful. I did this cheesy little stuff, you know. Just I would drink until I got just until I couldn't sit up anymore. My stomach would start. I'd start having problems with my, you know, my stomach or whatever was going on. And I would call somebody at three in the morning. Can, can you take me to the hospital? And they'd drive me to the emergency room and they'd do all these tests. And then the doctor would take me into his office and say, uh, do you, are you under a lot of stress? And I'd think, yeah, I am actually. Uh, I was working, I was in publishing at the time. I was working as a, a receiving clerk at, at a bookstore and I was <laughs> telling them, you know, I see, I see those trucks coming down the driveway. The stress is on. And, um, and he said, he said, uh, have you ever taken Valium before? And I said, no. So he prescribed Valium. And, and it was like 10 milligrams every four hours or, I don't know. I, I don't remember exactly. I didn't want to be underdosed. I knew that. And, um, and I took that and drank on it. And, and, and yet, when the time came, I just didn't like Valium because it just made me sit and, Sigh. Just. <laughs> and, and people would say, what's wrong, Charlie? And I'd go, nothing. <laughs> That's the problem. I don't get what's happening. I don't feel anything. See, I don't like feeling that way. I am an alcoholic. I want to live. I want to live. I don't want to sit around smoking angel dust and, you know, hallucinating like mad. If I want to induce psychosis, I just stop drinking for a few days. Uh, <laughs> alcoholics don't have to induce it with anything. We just stop. You know, and then things start, and then, then the masks come on. You know, things coming out of the walls and, you know, uh, that type of thing. But I, I, um, I, just want to live. I want to. I want to really. I want to take the grapes of life, you know, and crush them against the roof of my mouth. I want to rip through life. I want to grab it and taste it and smell it and feel it and hump it and chase it and live it and 
live it to the extent that it just rips the top three layers of my skin off and just leaves our raw nerve endings hanging out there and I could feel all the pain and the sorrow and the joy and the inexpressible experience of living to the point that I can write it down for you and suffer for you and at the peak of my powers I would rock it off like a meteor and explode in the air and just shower the world in stars. <laughs> That's what I want. And I'm going to do all that tomorrow, but tonight I need a couple of drinks, you know. And uh, I drank at places like the Humdinger and the Shimmy Shack and these dives, and I, I loved them. I just want to link arms with people and just start singing We Are the World. I love bars. I never, I never spoke to anybody in a bar, but I would just sit there and drink and just experience it. You know, I'd sit there for 12, 14 hours in the Humdinger for, you know, forever. And... Um, I got sicker and sicker, and I got more physically ill, and I got, I got married. I thought being married would make me a whole person, you know. I hate to disappoint you. Anybody in here might be feeling that way now. Uh, it, it just made me feel more helpless because now there's another person involved in my life. She was an alcoholic. She was a lovely human being, and she made one big mistake, and that was she fell in love with me. And I don't know anything about love because love is service and love is... Uh, being committed to someone else and I thought love was an emotion and so when the emotion went away I thought the love was gone too and I started to get the anger again and the frustration and then I'd have to drink more and then she'd get more disappointed and irritated and, and it just was endless and I would do things where I'd have to call her to come pick me up and I would be drunk and I would be saying rotten things at family gatherings uh, you know just blurt them out and have everybody half diving across the table to get their hands over my mouth and um and I was a miserable human being. I was an angry, miserable, drunk human being. And I was driving around in this Volkswagen that had no, it had no reverse, so I had to park it a special way every night. And sometimes people would take my special space, aim downhill, you know, I'd just be pissed. And, you know, and I, now I can't get out because I, it just, I'd go crazy over that kind of stuff. Everything made me crazy. And uh, I get pulled over by the police, and and they would let me go. These are the old, and back in the 70s. I mean, in, in LA, LA, they just kind of ask you where you're going, and are you are you, have you been drinking? Oh yeah, you know, too. And and uh, they say, well, why don't you go home? And I said, I was just headed home. You know, thank you very much, officer. And they let me go, or they get another call that it was more important, and I get free, and I never had to do jail time. I just now, I mean, I, I look at drunk drivers now, and it makes me cringe because I I know what I am. And I took people's life, lives in my hands over and over and over again and never had to pay for, pay the consequences of that. I have a good friend in the program in LA who, who did pay the consequences of that and she wound up killing a man, uh, in her, in her car. She stole her father's car and, and killed a guy. And she spent the last 20 years in Alcoholics Anonymous trying, as she says, to make that man's life mean something, you know, by helping other people. But I, I'm glad, I'm grateful that that didn't have to happen to me because it's happening tonight. It's happening everywhere. It's happening tonight. People as good as you and I are, better than we are, who are out there drinking and, and taking people out, you know. And, and there's no, uh, I heard someone, uh, one time I tried to get on the freeway going the wrong direction. And um, the people who were getting off the freeway were displeased. And they were trying to back me up. The guy in the front was literally bumping my bumper with his car to get me to back off, back up, which is hard when your car doesn't have any reverse in it, you know. But uh, I managed to, I wasn't that far on, and I could turn the wheel around and get out of there. And I was just in a rage, you know. And someone came up to me after I'd shared that at a meeting and said, well, God was with you that night. God took care of you. And I thought, no, 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 no. I was just lucky. God wasn't taking care of me that night. Because if I believe that, that means that God's not taking care of the people who are getting killed out there. I don't believe in that kind of a God. I was just lucky. It had nothing to do with God. I turned my back on God a long time ago. God wasn't riding in my passenger seat. God's not an idiot, you know. <laughs> Last thing you want to see is me in the windshield coming toward you, you know, uh, drunk. And, and it was just pure luck. And if you're here tonight and you're new and you've just gotten, you know, off the street or out of, out of a detox or something and you're in your first week of sobriety or so, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. You are truly a lucky person tonight, even though you may not feel it. Um, there's a, an old saying they throw around in AA all the time, and that is don't leave five minutes before the miracle happens in here. 
Uh, what I would suggest is that you not leave five minutes before you find out that the miracle has already happened. And it's just for you to take it and make something out of it. And it's hard. It really is hard. No one says this is easy. That's why most alcoholics or, or a big percentage of alcoholics who get to Alcoholics Anonymous don't stay sober. because Not because AA doesn't work, because AA works better than any single, al- any single treatment for alcoholism in the history of mankind. It's just that alcoholism is a completely amazing foe. It's a completely astonishing disease to have because it's so insidious. And I wound up, as I said, I, I, my wife divorced me. I was pissing blood at this point. I was sick as a dog. And I'm trying to, I'm going to get fired from my job on this receiving dock because I've been shoving paperwork in my drawer for the previous eight, nine months. I owed my boss about $500 in bad checks that I'd written to him. You know, which is not a wise thing to do. And um, I owed everybody. I owed the IRS. I owed several banks. I'd taken my wife's credit card. I, I didn't take it. I actually just had it. And <laughs> and and when you got it, I mean, use it. That's what I always thought. I I maxed it out, and and I was just out of control. I was living at my mother's house, which is certainly chick bait. And um, <laughs> I. Uh, my mom had moved out. Uh, boy, I'm depressing myself just even thinking about this. I got drunk at the humdinger one night and broke into my mom's house while she was away for the weekend because I didn't have a way to get home. I couldn't get back to L.A. So I broke into her house, which is nearby the humdinger, and, and I woke up in the morning in her nightgown. Um, <laughs> La-di-da. <laughs> what to do, what to do, what to do. You know? First, I've got to not tell anybody. <laughs> then I've got to erase it from my own memory. <laughs> um... The mortgage on the house I was living in was $118 a month or $120 a month, I forget which. I was about five months behind on the rent, on the mortgage, and we were about to lose the house. And I was a, I was a wreck. And so I went to a meditation retreat. <laughs> just, I was thinking. I had been in therapy for a couple of years. It was going marvelously, as you can tell. I was... Um, I was buying, I was stocking my house with groceries for Armageddon. I was buying canned goods and, and larding my house with, I mean, I had cupboards of canned goods. One, one after, about, after I was sober about a year, my sponsor came over to my house and he said, what's all this food? You got every cupboard I open up, there's canned food in the cupboards, you know. And what do you got all this stuff for? And I told him. And I was planning because I thought civilization was going to fall. I was getting more and more paranoid and he said, get rid of it. I had to get rid of it and give it to, you know, the, the, one of the food banks in the area. I filled up like nine shopping bags full of canned goods, just, to, just canned stuff to give it away. And um, so I was not doing well. I was shopping for guns on my lunch break uh, to protect myself. But I, I couldn't buy a gun because I had lousy credit. Lucky for you. Uh, LAUGHTER I got out of my car, you know, and I'm teetering on my heels, and I got it, my, my trademark deer stalker hat on, and I get out of the car, and, she, and I got my sunglasses on, and it's, it's 9.30 at night, you know, and, and she comes out on her front porch and goes, hey, Charlie, what's with the hat? And I go, oh, I forgot I had it on. I took it off and walked in the house, shut the door, and thought, I'll tell you what's with the hat, bitch. <laughs> Because when civilization collapses and you come running across the street for some niblets, I'm going to have my gun. I'm going to pick you off mid-sidewalk. That's what's with the hat. Get it? And that, that thought, but that thought would go like this. And then come out the other side and I'd feel guilty. I'd feel sad. I would feel out of control. I thought, what is happening to me? What is wrong with me? That I, 
I don't know what's going on with me. And I went to this meditation retreat because I've been in therapy. And that was, that was a result of two years of therapy. <laughs> now, I'm not a therapy basher, but therapy tends not to work on alcoholism because there's a prerequisite to therapy, and that's truth. And if you are an alcoholic and you're practicing your alcoholism, you don't know anything about the truth at all. You haven't got a clue. Don't even try to make up your mind because you don't know. And the fact that you're saying, yes, I do, means you still don't know. Because you don't. I don't. I need someone else to give me the truth. And, it, and it's in, in whatever fashion I can hear it. And I went to this meditation retreat, and I was going to kill myself. And I sat there, and I wanted to hang myself. I thought, my life is over. I can't live like this anymore. And I was going to hang myself. And I got a feeling inside. And it was a very undramatic moment, i got to tell you. There was no drama to it at all. It was just this moment that said, you are everything that you fear, and I still love you. I felt it and heard it right in here. It made me feel absolutely loved for about 30 seconds, and it went away. And I sat there, and I just sobbed for about four hours on this meditation retreat grounds. I was in a daze. I thought, something is terribly wrong here because I'm out of my mind. And I went home from there, and that was the 11th of June of 1981, and I haven't had a drink since. Um, I don't chippy around with my sobriety. I don't drink near beer because I choose not to be near sober. Um, <laughs> drinking near beer is like a recovering junkie buying empty syringes and just picking at his arm. You know? <laughs> um, and then I wound up... Uh, being brought to an AA meeting. I didn't like AA. My sister-in-law brought me. My sister-in-law, my first wife's brother's name was Bob. Bob and I got along famously. I only knew him for about a month. When we, he came over one night and we were drinking and having a great time. We were just absolutely in seventh heaven. And she told me Bob had problems with alcohol, but that wasn't true because he was we hit it off, and we had a wonderful time. And about three hours into the evening, I look over, and she's standing over by the bedroom door going, you know, which I know I'm not in for a compliment at that point. So I go walking over, go in the bedroom, and she shuts the door, and she said, stop giving Bob alcohol. Bob is an alcoholic. And I said, Bob is no more alcoholic than I am. <laughs> you are a nag. <laughs> Why don't you just back it up, sister? <laughs> I went back out, and Bob and I just carried on the evening. had a great time. And two weeks later, Bob was dead. He was 25 years old. He had a five-year-old daughter. He was one of the handsomest guys I'd ever known in my life and, and full of hope and potential and dreams. And he drowned. He went swimming one day when he'd been drinking, and he drowned in, this, in Lake Castaic in, in uh in California, and I had to go up and pick up his car and get his clothes and stuff. No one talked about his alcoholism then. I didn't. I wasn't going to bring it up. Nobody did. We all just shut our heads off and just shut it away. You know, well, years later, Bob's widow got out of a rehab, and she needed a ride to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And I had quit four days before, and I told her I'd give her a ride. And she had 22 days of sobriety, and she 12-stepped me in a 20-minute car ride on the way to that meeting because I was just going to drop her off and go and pick her up after the meeting. And she 12-stepped me. She had 22 days of sobriety, and she saved my life by getting me to come into that meeting, by convincing me that through her, her, the way she looked, the way she comported herself, the way she spoke of Alcoholics Anonymous made me interested enough to park the car and come inside against my better judgment. If you think that you don't have enough time to work with somebody who's newer than you are. 22 days gave me 23 years of life. You know, it, it saves me. Guess again. Find somebody who has less time than you do and work with them and let them know how you did it because that's how it works here. And um, I, like I said, I wound up in the Pacific Group. I eventually got a sponsor. My sponsor sat me down and said, listen, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get to a meeting every night I want you to get there early. I want you to shake hands. I want you to ask for phone numbers from the men. I want you to get a commitment at the meeting, and I want you to go out for coffee with people afterward, and I want you to call me every day. Got that? And I said, yeah. And he said, and I want you to shave that silly mustache off and get a haircut before you come, before I see you Friday at the men's stag. Okay. 
what has that got to do? I'm 30 years old at the time. What has that got to do with any? I didn't say that. I said, really? And he said, uh, <laughs> he said, I can see you're confused, but I normally, normally when I give a direction, I don't have to explain it or anything, but tonight I'm feeling kind of generous. So I'm going to give you a freebie sport. You just said you were willing to do anything to stay sober, right? And I had. And I said, yeah. And he said, and I just asked you to shave, right? And I said, yes. And he said, I'm just testing to see if you're willing to do anything to stay sober. If you can't shave just because I asked you to do it, what makes me think you're going to do the steps, which are a lot harder than shaving? I guess I'll find out Friday. And he got up and walked out of the restaurant. I was mad. I was furious. I thought I've, I've arrived in a cult. The only cult, incidentally, which tells you to go back into the world, get a job, pay your taxes, be nice to your mother, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and um, so I, um, I couldn't believe it. But you know what? I shaved that mustache off. And every fiber of me said, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. I got in there in that, mor- that morning and shaved it off and watched my only link to John Lennon. <laughs> David Niven, au revoir, and went to that meeting that night, and Bill took a look at me from across the room, and he came charging across. He's about six foot five, and he comes charging across the room, and he gets his arm around my shoulder, and he goes, here we go, sport. And um, he's been my sponsor ever since. And with a lot of help from a lot of other people in Alcoholics Anonymous, trust me. He hasn't, he hasn't taken it all on himself. I've had help from... In, Most of the speakers you've had here at this meeting that have come from my group, that's who I've gotten help from. People from across the country that I've been able to have experiences like this with have saved my life. And over years, you know, I wound up getting a a better job. I wound up getting, I wound up going back to college so I could have bitching rights about my job. That was the price. You say, oh, if you want to complain about your job, then go back to school and get a master's degree. So, okay, I will. You know, so I go back to get a master's degree. You know how I had to get a master's degree? I had to go to the college. And I go to Loyola Marymount, and I don't know how to get a master's degree. I don't know where to apply. I don't know who to ask. I'm standing in this place just ready to cry because I don't know what to do. And I'm 30 years, at the time I was about 33. So I had to go up to this gardener and say, can you tell me where I go to apply for the master's program here? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's over at the building right over there, second floor, just going in there. So I applied. Got accepted. Told Bill, can't do it. I haven't got any money. He said, why don't you get a loan? (laughs) The only reason I could get a loan is because for a year, after I turned a year, I started going every Thursday night and sat down with a fellow alcoholic who was an accountant in my group who volunteered his services, and he sat down with me every Thursday night for a year, an hour before the meeting, and he said, give this give them five dollars, give him ten dollars, give this one. And we kept track of everything I was paying. And over a period of about three years, I paid everybody off. I paid off the IRS, or was still in the process of paying off the IRS because of the help of another alcoholic who showed me how to balance a checkbook and pay bills on time. Because I was just, I was doing the old put the wrong checks in the wrong envelopes on purpose because you get a little float time back then. Not anymore, it's done. But I, uh, I... but I'm sure there are people still trying, but I um, would do that. And, and uh, you know, people helped me, and I got a loan. I wound up, go, wound up going back to school. And I was in school for a semester, and the, the dean of the English department at the college where I was unloading trucks at the bookstore came down one day and said, I'd known her for years, and she came down and said, you, are you, are you really back in college? Because I've heard that you went back to school. And I said, yeah. She said, what are you doing? I'm going to Loyola to get a degree in English. She said, good. How would you like to teach a class? Classes start soon. I've, I, I've got 33 students, and I don't have a teacher for that session. Can you do it? I said, i got to call somebody. So I called Bill. Bill says, take the job. I said, well, I thought I'd wait about a year while I was in school, so I'd really learn my subject matter better. Then I'd be much more comfortable and capable of going in and teaching a class, and all I heard on the other end was, Hello? And um, so uh, 
so I went back and said, okay, I can teach the class. And she said, good, here's the book. You start Tuesday. Thank you. And she left. I thought, Tuesday? Tuesday? You said teach the class. You didn't say Tuesday. You know, and I had to go. I had to study over the weekend, put together a syllabus. I spent hours putting the syllabus together, went into the class, and I, I'm pacing back and forth in front of the classroom for about 20 minutes, peeking inside, and they're all in there, you know. They're all in there waiting. And uh, so I, at the at assigned moment, I walk into the class and introduce myself, you know, went over, wrote my name on the board, handed out my syllabus, explained the grading, the papers, all the stuff we're going to do in the class, and then I had another 50 minutes left in the hour. And uh, I thought, I study the parts of speech this weekend. You're going to learn them too. I didn't say that. I said, take out a notebook. And I turned around and started writing the parts of speech on the board, noun, verb, adjective. And I turned back around, and they were all writing in their notebooks and looking up at the board, and I thought, they bought it. (laughs) They don't know I'm not a teacher. I'm a loser. I'm just pretending to be a teacher. Clear your desk and take out a sheet of paper. I always wanted to say that, but I... uh, I, uh, I taught there for seven years, uh, part-time. And then the next year, apparently the pain of teaching college wasn't enough. I started teaching high school. And, um, and I'll tell you something. For the challenge that, uh, that I had teaching high school, because it was a tough gig, I loved every student I had because of a simple instruction that somebody gave me in my group. I, I got two nuns that I got sober with, which shows that God has a sense of humor. And... Um, Sheila and Mary, and they're both from Ireland, and they both, and, and Mary talks like this, you know, they both do. And I went up to Mary because they're both in education, and I said, Mary, I gotta teach high school. I'm teaching high school. How do you deal with the kids? And she goes, You just treat them like little newcomers. You let them know, you let them know that you've got something that they might want, and you're willing to go to any lengths to give it to them, as long as they're willing to go to any lengths to get it. But if they're only willing to go that far to get it, then that's how far you're willing to go to give it to them. If they're willing to go this far, then you'll go that far. That was in the back of my mind the entire time I taught. And these kids responded to it. You treat young people honestly, and they treat you honestly. You know, I love teaching high school kids. I loved it. And uh, I even had tough kids. I mean, I had some really tough kids. But you know what? Saved my life. To learn how to actually... Love somebody unconditionally well, from what I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous, go out there and treat them like human beings and treat them with respect and, and, uh, and honor and dignity that they deserve. Because nobody treats teenagers right. You know, everybody craps on them. And so you have to go in there and pretend that, you know, you're the person who's not going to do that to them, you know, and do it. Follow through on it. You have to pretend for a while, but it was great. I learned more from those kids than they ever learned from me. And, and it was all because of what I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I wound up later getting a writing job. I wound up becoming a professional writer. I've been doing that for the last 14 years. Uh, and I can't tell you how I did that. It's a long story. I can give you my number if you want to call. First get a job at a bookstore, uh, and then call me 12 years later. And I'll tell you what your next step is. But uh, um, I started out, I wanted to write the great American novel. I started writing Bugs Bunny cartoons. Uh, and I went from there to writing other stuff and, and uh, wound up becoming a, a senior editor in a publishing company and, and doing that for years and writing, writing books. And I write full time now. I love it. You know? But I found that out by other alcoholics who do that who told me how to sit down and do it. You know? I had to learn like a child everything I've had to do. And my life was going really well, and I was doing really well. And I fell in love at about 17 years sober, and I married a woman. And I wanted to have children with her. I wanted to spend the rest of my life with this person. I was deeply in love with her. And uh, we had two children, two, I mean, the best children I've ever encountered in my life. My kids are, are uh, really, I'm honored to be their father. I look at these kids and I can't believe I'm their dad. They're just, they're beautiful children. And my, my son is five and my daughter's three and a half and a couple of weeks ago, we're sitting at the kitchen table, and my son stops eating, and he looks at me with the most innocent, beautiful little look on his face, and he says, "Are you? When I grow up, are you going to be alive?" <laughs> and 
and my temptation was to say, not if I have another phone call with your mother like the one I had today, but uh, I didn't because I never, I made a point to never say anything bad about their mother because we got a divorce uh, in the last couple of years. And um, I don't want to go into any detail about it because we both had problems in the marriage and, and uh, it was unsolvable. And my wife, my ex-wife is in Alcoholics Anonymous, and she needs the ground to be fertile here, too, for her. So I, I say nothing bad about her to, uh, from an AA podium, and I don't say anything bad about her to my children. I, if I complain, I complain to my sponsor and, uh, and some other guys that are my close friends that I can talk to about this. Because when I complain, I'm asking for a solution, and I have to, get, I have to do what I've been told to do. I made amends to my parents. My father died when I was 22. And I, I made amends to him about 10 years after I got sober, uh, stalled, put it off, put it off, put it off, and finally uh, made amends to him. And uh, my dad, you know, for, he was a, like I said, he was a DI in the Marine Corps, and uh, I was sure he was disappointed in me. I was sure of it, because I acted that way. And I went and made amends to his grave and did what Clint H. talked about doing, and that is you just clean the grave and you sit down and talk to him. And I did. And I told him I was with you. And I told him what I was doing in my sobriety and that my life was good and and that I'd learned a lot in sobriety about what he had taught me and that I didn't listen to him at the start. And, you know, I walked out of there and I didn't feel like anything had really happened. I thought, you know, another bogus step. And about two months later, somebody was talking to me about my dad, and I didn't feel any guilt at all. I was able to talk about it, and I felt no disappointment. And I knew my father had not been disappointed in me at all, nor had my mother. And uh, I found out otherwise, too, when I took my inventory. Uh, my dad, I'll tell you a story, and I'll sit down, because I'll, let me just explain something first. I've been through a, a really difficult couple of years with this divorce. It was the most acrimonious, painful, emasculating grinding, resentful experience that you can have over a protracted period of time. And I went through it with my children and my this woman, and I had been offered by three professionals antidepressants because I've been in a, a little depressed. Uh, I always laugh when alcoholics say, you know, I've been really depressed for a couple of weeks. You know? Duh! I, I get up in the morning. If I'm not depressed, I go back to bed till I am. You know, uh, <laughs> it's just part of the turf. Deal with it. Now, some people need, some people genuinely need medication for depression. We're not doctors in AA, and we got no business telling people when to stop taking medication. Period. But I chose not to take the medication that they asked me if I wanted to take because I wanted to try it this way, and and I stayed sober. And it's been difficult, you know, but. Uh, I, people in AA have been so loving to me and so good to me and to my family. And um, my father was a prime example of that kind of love that people in AA graciously give. Chris shows up at the airport in the middle of the day on a day when there's two major political figures in town, fights the traffic for an hour and gets the, the airport to pick me up and never complains about it. You know, People take me out to dinner. I, we, had a, we had a great time yesterday and, and last night at the meeting. I see John. I see a lot of guys in here I've known from going up to Mackenzie River. And, uh, um, you know, there's goodness around here. It's just everywhere. It's a conspiracy of kindness. Something's happening in here. You don't even have to... You don't have to believe in God to stay sober. I got to tell you that. But there's, and you can be an atheist and successfully stay sober. You're welcome here. But I'll tell you something. There's something happening in Alcoholics Anonymous in this room tonight. It's not me. It's something going on in the room that makes people feel better about their life and better about each other, so that they are willing to go into the day tomorrow and and deal with people out there and treat them the same way we treat each other. But there's something going on in here. There's something in the room. And whatever that thing is, whatever the thing in the room is, you can call it anything you want. If you choose to call it God or Jesus or Muhammad or Ed or Edwina, whatever you want to call it, you can't deny it. Whatever name you give it is your choice. However you perceive it is your choice. However you understand it is your choice, not mine. And my dad taught me about the kind of love that I learned about in AA. And, I, and I'll tell you the story and I'll sit down. He, um, from the time I was in about the, the seventh grade till about the tenth grade, he would get up every morning. He was a farm guy. And he made about, you know, 
150 bucks a week. And he would, he, he was a, a carpenter. He'd wear squishy soled shoes. He'd go to work with a lunchbox and other kids' dads were going to work with a briefcase. And I was humiliated to be around my dad because he was a Minnesota farmer. And, uh, and I was going to be somebody, boy. And I would get, he'd get up in the morning and he'd make lunch for me and he would put fruit and sandwich and chips and stuff in the bag and leave it for me by the door. And then at six o'clock he left to go to work. He was never sick a day, a day from work, really. He never missed work. He would go to this job that I know he didn't care about that much, but he would go do it because he had a family. And he would make lunch for me and leave it for me. And I would get up in the morning about an hour after he left. I'd get ready for school, grab my lunch, walk out the door, go to school, cross the property line, and just chuck the lunch in the trash can and just keep walking because cool kids don't buy, don't take their lunch to school. They buy it. I don't need one more piece of damn evidence and I'm a dork. You know, I've already, it's already, you know, how much more do you need? I'm, I'm, I'm Lee Riders in a Levi's world, you know, and, uh, and I'm completely, I got cow catcher, I got those grass catching pants and, and, uh, I'm a dork. I don't, why do I have to carry this lunch? Why can't they just give me money to buy a lunch so I don't have to suffer this? So I throw it away every single day and just be angry about it and angry at lunchtime. I have to pretend that I ate my lunch, that I bought it, you know? And, and I didn't consciously make the connection, but every time I did that, a little bit tightened up in my guts, and it made me keep my father at a little bit of a distance unconsciously. I never paid that much attention to him. I always kept him at arm's length, and I couldn't look him in the eye because he, would, he was making me my lunch, and I would throw it away every day, and it distanced me from him. And I thought it was him. I thought it was him. And his disappointment that kept us from being close and so I made an amends to my dad and felt better about it. And I went to my mom one day and I sat down at her kitchen table and I said, you know, I got a little confession to make. And I'd made amends to my mother before. I said, I used to throw my lunch away every day. Dad would make lunch for me and I'd toss it in the trash can. And she says, yeah, I know. And I said, well, how did you know? And she said, well, your father told me. He told me that you were throwing your lunch away we talk about it. I said, well, how did he know that I was throwing my lunch away? And she said, well, he would ask you questions about your lunch and you always gave him the wrong answer. Every so often he'd just ask you how your sandwich was, your bologna sandwich, and you'd say it was great and it was peanut butter. You know, he'd ask you how your apple was and you'd say perfect and he'd say, and he knew it was an orange. So he knew you were throwing your lunch away. You weren't even looking at it. And it just clobbered me. And I said, well, if he knew I was throwing it away, then why did he keep making it for me? And my mom just looked at me across the table with a half smile on her face, and I understood completely what happened. He didn't care what the results were of his actions. He just loved his child. He would make lunch and let me throw it away forever because he loved making lunch for his son. And if that doesn't mean anything to you as part of that story, I'll tell you something. If you're new, this is where the lunch is served every day, every night in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's laid out for you here. This is where the nutrition is for your soul. And you can come here and take of it like the people are doing tonight. And you walk out of here feeling full and your soul feels alive and you feel like you have energy and a new focus on life. Or you can walk away from this and suffer the consequences, whatever those are. I hope you don't. But I'll tell you something. If you go away from here, we hope you'll come back because we're going to keep serving it up every single night. We are not going to stop. We will keep putting it out here for you until you want it. And we care. That's what people care about in here. That's what love is. It's that dry-eyed humility that brings people in to set up chairs, to make coffee, to pick up somebody at the airport, to be kind to a newcomer, to bring something to the meeting that they don't know how it's going to be used in the course of it. People just do it because they know that an alcoholic is going to get some benefit out of it somewhere. And then we do it because it adds to whatever it is in the room we're putting the it into that in our own way, and it is much bigger than any of us are. So I hope you stay. I really, really am honored to be here, and I want to thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. 
Thank you very much.